Hello, I'm James White. Let's talk about history. History as a profession first appeared in the 19th century. Since then, the methodologies and values in history have changed. This, this study of change is known as historiography. In this change, history has moved away from biases and become more self-aware. This narrative is good and dandy and all, but it isn't entirely true. Let's face it, history has been written since the time of the ancient Greeks. Herodotus wrote the first history, but professional historians don't view those histories as really like history. It's more primary or eyewitness accounts, which is utter nonsense. The Roman historian Plutarch wrote the, his biography on the Gracchi brothers 200 years after they died, but he is still known as an eyewitness to the Gracchi. So the real question is, why aren't people like Plutarch and Herodotus considered historians? Why are they primary accounts instead of history? So in order to do this, let's look at the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, is really the sequel to Rome. And much like all sequels, they're much less respected and much less loved than their predecessor but they offer one of the clearest historiographical accounts throughout the ancient world. The reason that the Byzantines have the best record for historiographical evidence is because they were very interested in history. Starting with Eusebius, who wrote the first ecclesiastical history, all the way up to 1453 when the Byzantine Empire collapsed, there was constantly, pretty much every 50 years, a new historian would come in and write, the history of the reigns of the emperors from the last time that a historian wrote up until the present. Not a lot of these historians are famous, but there are a few such as Michael Pacellus, Anno Khomeini, and of course Procopius, the most famous of the Byzantine historians. Ancient and medieval historians were oftentimes either connected to religion or some sort of royalty. Therefore, when writing their history, these loyalties show up very, very clearly. One of these historians was Evagrius Scholasticus. St Scholasticus had close ties to the Eastern Church and the Patriarch of Antioch. Because of this, his primary focus in his history is religion. Everything in Evagrius Scholasticus's ecclesiastical history was caused by either God or the devil. This obviously doesn't fly with modern historians who tend to be inc incredibly secular. As well as this belief in a divine intervention, Evagrius has a clear bias towards orthodoxy. Everybody who wasn't orthodox was filth and might, might as well have been the people that personally killed Jesus. This train of thought is not localized to just Mr. Scholasticus. Procopius, too, spent time describing his enemies in overtly religious terms and attacks. And this is despite him really being not very religious himself. In Procopius's secret history, he describes Justinian as a demon in a human disguise who would take off his own head when he went to bed. How much of this is purely invective is impossible to tell, but he described Justinian this way regardless of the truth. The third hist historian we're going to look at is Michael Pacellus, or maybe Cellus. I don't know if he's silent. But anyways, Pacellus was a monk and therefore had the attitude of a monk. Any defeat an emperor had was due to a personal failing or vice they had. Whether it be pride or lavish living, it caused downfalls, while humility, according to Pacellus, was what led to success for emperors. The historian who directly followed Pacellus was Anna Comene. She was the daughter of an emperor. Her history only covers the life and times of her father. In her reason for writing history, she states that historians need to look at both the good in their enemies and the flaws in their friends. This sounds pretty modern, right? However, she also declares that she wrote her history because her father is pretty much the most awesome person ever. He was cunning and daring, and everybody else just ends up being archetypes, and any common folk is just seen as a big part of a mob and a bunch of rabble-rousers causing issues. With this in mind, it's clear why historians do not want to claim these people as part of their historiographical tradition. 
the first modern historian to write about Byzantium was Edward Gibbon. In his magnus opus, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Gibbon shows a great distaste for the Byzantines. He saw them as a backwards people who only cared about pointless religious debates. He had an open disregard for Christianity and believed the Romans were better off before it. He describes one man's diet in his book as being regulated, not with the prudence of, of a philosopher, but the superstition of a monk. This shows that even diets were messed up, according to Ed Edward Gibbon, once Christianity rolled along. And he, because Justinian was a very religious man, he does everything in his power to discredit both Justinian and his wife Theodora, which ended up revolving a lot around references to Procopius' secret history, which was an invective against Justinian. The second of the modern stories we're going to look at is A.A. Vasiliev. He is basically the anti-Gibbon. He disliked Gibbon because he loved the Byzantines. But the way he looked at history was he looked at the history of great men. So he would look at individual people and see their flaws, try to turn them into either tragic heroes or epic villains. He saw the non-Christian Julian the Apostate as one such tragic hero who tried bringing back the glory days that had been lost once the Christians were all around. It's not to say that he hated Christians because he also loved Theodora who was a very devout Christian once she became emperor or empress. But additionally, Vasiliev buys into the idea of imperialistic history. Everything he sees in the Byzantines is he supports imperialism over the barbarians. He, he supports civiliza civilization over barbarism. <clears throat> and he effectively is very... Uh, devout in his belief in Eurocentricism, which is common really all throughout him and Gibbon and the next person, Charles Dial. So the next person we're going to look at, as I just mentioned, is Charles Dial. He was a bit of a totalitarian. He, he thought the best emperors were the ones that were strict, used lots of violence, were willing to smash their opponents, and really just be all in all very repressive. One of his favorite dynasties was the Basilian dynasty, because everybody in that dynasty were stern rulers and dictators who were only interested in power. After Basil II fell, according to Charles Zyle, the throne fell into the hands of women or inferior and negligent men. Charles Zyle's second favorite dynasty was that of the Comnene, from which Anna Comnene was part of. He saw them all as great, wise tyrants, like medieval knights, but better. Throughout, throughout his entire history, he, he looks for these repressive people as being the apex of Byzantine society. <clears throat> people like Justinian, he sees as being good, but ended up having too, too high of standards, and they ended up shooting themselves in the foot because of their high standards. The second to last person we're going to look at is a man named Kazdan from the Soviet Union. He was part of the Annales school of thought. <clears throat> so he looked at the little folk, and all throughout his reading of Byzantine history, he sees the little people, the common folk, as having all the agency. During the Trinitarian disputes of the Monophysites, for instance, he thought that it was based on the spirit of the people. It wasn't just mob action or political strife that was causing this uh, religious dispute. He saw it as being just an outpouring of the individuals and the common folk wanting their say in religious ideology. So the last person we're going to look at is James O'Donnell, the author of this book. I bring up that book because it's the book that got me interested in the Byzantines to begin with. I bought it on accident. And I found his presumptions a bit flawed. He, like Edward Gibbon before him, takes a very anti-religious stance. Or at least a stance that says being devout in your belief is a bad thing. Throughout his entire book, whenever he talks about Justinian, he brings up the fact that it was Justinian's devout belief in God that caused, caused him to fail. The belief in God and the refusal to see other people's beliefs is what caused him to fail while he invaded Italy 
I mean, he invaded Africa. <clears throat> In many ways, the way we look at history has not changed from the time of Evagrius Scholasticus all the way to James O'Donnell, which is only a few years ago. <clears throat> People still today look for seeing their own values being justified in a historical context. Back during the times of the Byzantines, they would look for things to justify their religious beliefs. Now that we've entered into a more secular society, we tend to try justifying our secular beliefs in the historical context. So the way we study history has not changed, it has just been the attitudes in which we project onto history has changed. Therefore, it's mere arrogance that we refuse to admit Pacellus and Procopius and Evagrius into our historiographical tradition. They did exactly what we did, just through a different lens. And therefore, we should accept them and see them as really being our forerunners in the art of history.